We're here to talk about limits. Being a young person is all about limits. You're always told what to do and when to do it. We all find our ways of expanding our boundaries by rebelling against our parents or our teachers, by chasing girls, or by finding the limits of our athletic power. Possibly the most liberating experience, however, may be pushing the seemingly infinite boundaries of science. Every scientific discovery makes the world look even more intriguing and complex than was ever thought possible before. I'm one of the few youngsters to have been lucky enough to experience discovery firsthand and to glimpse some of nature's dazzling complexity and beauty in its ultimate form in the heavens. Our everyday experience is profoundly based on our interactions with matter. We are who we are because of the way matter works. The reason I can't compress or distort this apple easily is because of the electromagnetic force. The strong and weak nuclear forces keep its atoms from flying apart. And when I throw it up, it feels the force of gravity. It is made up of oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, phosphorus, and so on. All of the atoms that Jocelyn mentioned earlier. And these are what physicists call normal or baryonic matter. But this is where things start to become strange. The observation of huge clusters of stars called galaxies shows that only 5% of the total matter of the universe is in this usual form. Let's spend a couple of minutes looking at the evidence for this. It's instructive first to look at the case of our solar system. In our solar system, almost all of the mass, a staggering 99.9% .9 of it, is confined to the sun. The well-known physics of Newton allows us to predict the motions and the orbital velocities of the planets, and we've known for centuries that these agree beautifully with observation. What we see and what this animation shows you is that the velocities of the planets decrease with distance to the sun. So you see Mercury spinning around there at breakneck speed, while Jupiter and Saturn further out plod along serenely. Plotting the velocities of these planets up as a function of distance, we see that the observed and expected fall-off obeys a 1 over square root r relation. We would expect exactly the same behavior in galaxies, past the point where all of the mass is located. Is this actually the case? It came as a big surprise in the 1980s when the velocity of very tenuous hydrogen gas beyond the stellar disk of galaxies was measured. What was seen was that the velocity of the gas did not decrease with distance to the center of the galaxy, but instead remained constant and in some cases even increased. This is strong evidence that there is unseen material in galaxies, but it is not a mere detail. What we're talking about is a quantity of matter that is a factor of 10 or more than that of the ordinary matter observed as stars and gas. Astronomers have come to refer to this surplus of matter in galaxies as dark matter, and they have observed it in various other structures across the universe, ranging from gigantic clusters of galaxies all the way down to the very tiniest galaxies, where the need for dark matter is even more pronounced. So what could this unseen material be? Determining its nature is one of the holy grails of modern physics, given that it will tell us what most of our universe is made out of. Astronomers have been able to reject most hypotheses, so we know that we're not talking about a vast population of black holes or very faint stars, for instance. About the only possibility that remains is that it is some form of an elementary particle that interacts only very weakly with normal matter. If the standard expectation is correct, there are billions of dark matter particles zooming across this room at this very moment and crossing our bodies without disturbing us. I suspect that physicists may have watched Star Wars in their youth because what they've invented sounds very much like the force. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together, in the words of Obi-Wan Kenobi. So what role does this dark matter have to play in our cosmos? Perhaps not unsurprisingly, given its preponderance, it controls the formation of galaxies, and hence that of stars, planets, and consequently us. We think we know a fair amount about the state of the universe shortly after the Big Bang. We observe the formation of the very first hydrogen atoms as a faint glow in microwave light. This has been measured by a series of satellites that have shown that it is of almost uniform temperature across the sky. If you look in this direction, or in this other direction, you'll see almost exactly the same temperature, which means that the density of the hydrogen gas shortly after the Big Bang was almost entirely uniform. 
Knowing these initial conditions, this allows us to make very detailed computer simulations of how the universe evolved under the influence of the gravity induced by dark matter. From an initial almost smooth soup, regions of slightly higher density tend to feel more the force of gravity, stick together, and attract neighboring blobs of matter. This causes a runaway effect, where small structures fall towards slightly larger structures, and so on in every direction. The net result of this is a hierarchical distribution of matter that agrees remarkably well with our observations on scales larger than those of individual galaxies. On the scale of individual galaxies, what the simulations predict is that every giant galaxy is surrounded by a gigantic so-called halo of dark matter, which would account for the observed flatness of the velocity curve past the edge of the visible disk. This animation shows you the endpoint of one such simulation at the present day, focusing on a region around a galaxy. You can see a swarm of tens of thousands of small lumps of dark matter, which are just scaled down versions of the giant dark matter halo in which they live. You see very clearly that they move around in a random fashion, and their masses turn out to be similar to those of the satellite galaxies that are observed around every giant galaxy. So are these simulations confirmed by observation? <coughs> to answer this question, my father and his team turned their attention to the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the nearest giant galaxy to our Milky Way, and that you can see by the naked eye on a clear night. It's an awe-inspiring sight to know that the light that reaches your eye has taken two million years to reach you from the stars. Now's the perfect time of year to observe it, so I recommend that you go out into the countryside, take a pair of binoculars, and look out for it. So on this photograph of Andromeda, which covers an angle of about a thumb at arm's length, you can see two of its dwarf galaxy companions. And we know that these are satellites of Andromeda from measurements of their velocities. Over the last 12 years, the team has used the Canada-France Hawaii telescope to map out the vast region beyond the disk of Andromeda. This has unveiled a whole new set of satellite galaxies shown here in red, but you'll notice that the number is very far from the expected thousands. This deficit has been known for some time and is one of the major problems of dark matter theory. My father and his team proceeded to measure accurately the positions on the sky, the distances, and the velocities of these objects. It is important to note that only the line of sight component of velocity may be measured to very distant objects. This uses the Doppler effect which also accounts for the change in pitch of ambulance sirens as they approach or recede from you. Objects that are moving towards us are blue shifted by the Doppler effect, and the whole system of Andromeda and its satellites is indeed approaching us, as I show on this plot. Now this is where I came in. In the summer of 2012, I had finished working through a book on Python programming, and my father suggested that I try out my new programming skills by exploring the data that he just collected. In particular, he was interested in analyzing whether Andromeda's satellite galaxies were randomly distributed or not. The simplest non-random configuration that one can think of is a planar distribution. It was already clear that not all of the satellite galaxies were confined to a plane, but it was still possible that there were two populations present, a roughly spherical and randomly scattered subpopulation, and another that could be confined to a plane. My father devised a computer algorithm to find the plane along which the satellites were most closely aligned. However, he had left out the motions of the satellites in his calculation. What I did was to construct a computer program that took the velocities of the satellite galaxies as we observed from Earth and transformed that view into what would be seen from Andromeda. It is possible to do this because for any real plane, the motions of the satellites within that plane have to be confined to that plane and are determined by a model of the mass distribution within the dark matter halo. This allowed us to recognize that there was indeed a very special plane that contained half of the satellite galaxies, and that showed a coherent sense of motion. Indeed, we saw that the satellites to the north of Andromeda are moving away from us, and those to the south are coming towards us. This suggests a coherent rotational sense. The probability of a chance alignment like this is very small, about 2 in 10,000. And there are also hints of a similar arrangement around the Milky Way. 
this coherent rotation is completely unexpected given the results of dark matter simulation, similar to the one I showed you earlier. I'm going to show you an animation that we made after the discovery. We start at our sun and fly out towards the Andromeda galaxy through our stellar neighborhood. As we slowly leave the Milky Way, you can see that many of the stars that contaminate our field of view disappear behind us. We're going to stop at a point about a tenth of the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, just outside the disk of our Milky Way. We show the stars that were detected around Andromeda, thanks to our survey, and you can see a complex network of stellar streams crisscrossing through the halo of the galaxy. I'm now increasing the brightness of the satellite galaxies that we discovered so that you can see them, and we highlight those in the plane in red. We start turning at a constant distance from the Andromeda galaxy, and you can see that the structure that we discovered is very thin when viewed at John. We stop and turn off the satellites that lie outside the plane, and resume turning. We're going to stop soon with a face-on view to examine the motions of the satellites within the plane. The Milky Way is off to the left. You can see that the satellites to the north of Andromeda move towards us, uh, away from us, and those to the south come towards us. This suggests a common rotational sense. We continue and finish our voyage close to the point we started it from. So pan out through the Milky Way to a distant vantage point where we'll be able to appreciate the relative sizes of the Milky Way, the Andromeda galaxy, and the giant planar structure that we discovered. And some credits. So what does this all mean? Basically, there are two options. <laughs> if dark matter theory is indeed correct, then it appears that the only way to account for this peculiar alignment is to posit that the satellite galaxies that we observe have nothing to do with the dark matter lumps seen in simulations. This is a possibility if the satellites within our plane did not form from dark matter. There is a class of satellite galaxies known as tidal dwarf galaxies that form when two giant gas-rich galaxies collide, and these contain no dark matter. Their distribution could be planar because they form along giant arcs of gas that are stripped off of the giant galaxies, as you can see here. However, the satellite galaxies around Andromeda do appear to be dominated by dark matter, so this interpretation seems difficult. The other option is much more radical. It is possible that our understanding of dark matter is incorrect or incomplete. Perhaps we do not fully understand the physics of the hypothesized dark matter particle. Or indeed, it may be that our theory of gravity is not fully applicable for the extremely low accelerations found in the outskirts of galaxies. Only time and lots of hard work on the part of astronomers and particle physicists will resolve this puzzle of cosmic scale. Which brings us back nicely to the main theme of this conference. It may appear that the distance, time, and mass scales of what I've been talking about are essentially unlimited. However, if there's one thing I've learned from my mathematical education, it's that any finite number can be renormalized by dividing by a larger number. For instance, in considering the problem I've been discussing, we could have divided the distances by the size of the universe and the times by the age of the universe. This is something that is commonly done when studying the evolution of the universe. If we'd done that, we would have had the impression that the amazingly large dimensions of the Andromeda galaxy and its satellites would have minuscule numerical values. One should not be intimidated by large, so-called astronomical numbers. Indeed, in the economic domain, they're much more extreme. For instance, over a period of a few years, the Zimbabwean dollar was devalued by 30 orders of magnitude. These 30 orders of magnitude would be enough to inflate a millimeter to more than the size of the universe. Mathematics also teaches us that there's an important intrinsic difference between large and truly unlimited quantities. But I fear that for many people, just as the universe appears limitless, 
so does the extent of human possibilities. I personally suspect that such a naive belief in the absence of limits is at the root of many societal evils, such as the massive debt that many European countries currently labor under. It is probable that this has been brought about by the assumption of infinite resources and limitless timescales that are longer than the term of office of the decision makers. I'm extremely concerned about the future of Europe as a young person. And I feel that such an attitude on the part of the leaders and of the population will endanger the situation of Europe and of the world even further. The long-term consequences of socio-economic projects must, therefore, be studied with caution and foresight. As with everything, however, a balance must be reached, as well-founded optimism in the breadth and possibilities of scientific progress will help address many of the world's problems. It is ironic that today people often view limits in a negative way. Maybe this springs from bad memories of our school days. A certain Pink Floyd song springs to mind. But even though science is built upon the demolition of boundaries, it is also a process of trying to find out the ultimate laws that govern our universe, which are themselves nothing other than limits. It is these fundamental limits, these natural laws, that are essential in providing us the structure that allows us to understand the world. Without them, everything would be chaos. Thank you.